It's a great pleasure to kick off our first panel today with uh, distinguished guests here and many distinguished and well-informed faces in the audience as well. And I hope that after we've had a bit of discussion up here and our initial statements, um, we'll be able to get on to some discussion. I'm, you may be wondering, why is there an empty chair? There's not going to be an empty chair any longer because I'm very grateful to um, Minister Siarto for joining us. Perfect timing. Pleasure to see you. Hi, Peter. How are you? The uh, most, I think, of the many interesting points that uh, Minister Petricek made, I think the don't take anything for granted is the one that really hits home. Um, when we started SEPA um, more than uh, a decade ago, the idea that we would be needing to discuss the fundamentals of the transatlantic relationship and the fundamentals of cohesion would have seemed very shocking. Um, there was unfinished business then, just like there's unfinished business now, but today's unfinished business is a lot more unfinished than the unfinished business then, and the questions are more fundamental and the answers are in many cases more elusive. I was particularly pleased um, that, we, that we had the um, brief mention of Brexit, and as a British citizen trying very hard to stop Brexit, I'd say um, they were wrong when they said we were going to leave on March the 31st. They were wrong when they said we were going to leave on May the 8th. I think they're wrong when they um, say we're going to leave on October the 31st. We're fighting very hard to stay in the European Union, and we are by no means done yet, helped sometimes by the mistakes made by that as you wonderfully described, a handful of irresponsible individuals, otherwise known as the British government. Um, so I'm going to come back to um, Thomas Petricek um, again with some, some, uh, some follow-up, um, because his speech raised many, many questions. And then we're going to go on to the rest of the panel for their um, prepared remarks and then get into a discussion. Um, but I suppose the first question which you, which you just touched on, which I want to hear in a bit more detail, is what does it really mean for allies um, when we hear America first? Uh, we can all say Czech Republic first, Poland first, Britain first, Germany first. Perhaps Germany first would sound particularly ominous in the European context. America first. Where does that leave allies? How do we manage that, um, how do we manage that kind of rhetorical trope which bites very hard into public opinion in allied countries. It's very hard to say to our people, make sacrifices, blood, treasure, diplomatic capital, economic hits, um, on behalf of an ally that says America first. How do we, how do, how do, how do we manage that? Uh, thank you very much for the question. And uh, let me say that uh, all politicians have to have in mind uh, the interests of uh, their citizens first. And uh, it's uh, relatively natural that uh, I have in mind uh, the interest and, uh, and well-being of Czech citizens, better of Hungarian. But it doesn't, mind, uh, doesn't, ma doesn't mean that uh, we cannot look at uh, or shouldn't look at uh, the interests of our partners. And uh, uh, I mentioned it uh, very briefly uh, that I really liked uh, the words of uh, Jens Stoltenberg in Congress that. Uh, in this world, even America cannot uh, solve everything alone, and the uh, United States needs partners, needs friends, and uh, it's necessary to, uh, to work on the partnership we, we have, because uh, uh, as in marriage, uh, if you don't care about uh, your partner, you end up uh, with a divorce, and uh, maybe you can have in mind what you want to do in a, in a partnership, but uh, you have to also have in mind what the partner uh, expects from the uh, from the partnership. There are always two in couple, or in our case, there are more in couple. But uh, uh, for me, America first uh, doesn't mean necessarily that there is no place for us uh, allies. Rather, that uh, in order to have these two words really work, America needs uh, good friends, uh, good allies. And uh, only with them, uh, U.S. can achieve what uh, has been set up. And let me follow that up with another question, that we have these very difficult issues now. We have the, um, the row about China, 
We have the row about Iran. We have differences on climate. The China problem breaks down into other ones about Huawei and 5G on one side, Belt and Road on the other. And I think for many people in the public, they think there's more now that divides um, the Atlantic Alliance than unites it. One of the things that one could really put one's hand on one's heart and say America and um, its European allies are really on the same page on that. So if you look at that long, difficult list of issues, what role is there for a country like the Czech Republic with its excellent relations um, with the United States, but also, as you mentioned, a country of whom Brussels is not a foreign city. Brussels is another seat of government for the Czech Republic. How do you, can you balance your European and your transatlantic ties on these divisive issues? For us, we shouldn't overestimate the differences we, uh, we have at the moment. We had differences in the past as well, and uh, we were always able to overcome them. And uh, that's uh, also a lesson or takeaway uh, for this time, for today, that uh, there are always ways how to overcome uh, what divides us. And uh, indeed, uh, we can uh, argue about uh, what to do with Iran, uh, we can uh, argue what to do with China, but uh, in general, I believe that uh, we share common, uh, common interest, that uh, we share the interest to create a, a global system where uh, both sides of the Atlantic uh, can benefit uh, from trade, from security cooperation, from cooperation that uh, tackles uh, the major, major global challenges like climate change or that will be discussed uh, in huge detail in New York this week. Uh, so maybe we should start uh, by identifying what uh, connects us uh, rather than uh, stressing what divides us. I think you you uh, echoing a very important point you made in your opening remarks about the dangers of defeatism. And I think that's absolutely right. It's, uh, we're in a, an era where doom and gloom have become very fashionable. And um, you're absolutely right to highlight the, um, all the things that still work. So I'm now going to turn to uh, Minister... Uh, Siarto, uh, not your first time at SIPA Forum. Um, it's very good to have you, um, have you back again, and we very much appreciate the cooperation we have from, um, from, from, from Hungary, both here and in all the other things we do. Um, but let me turn to you and ask you, how um, does Hungary see this new era of great power competition? Because we have it very clearly articulated from the White House that we are back in an era of competition with Russia, back in an era of competition with China. And to put that bluntly, in that era, you're either on the team or you're on the menu. Um, if you are with America in its competition with Russia and China, that's great and you're a strong ally. If you want to pursue your own interests with Russia or with China, um, then you will be in a different category. And we've seen already with um, Germany, the sanctions, talk of sanctions on American um, on German companies for building Nord Stream 2. So where's Hungary? Are you on the menu or are you on the table? <laughs> on the team? Look, we um, base our uh, foreign policy strategy on uh, two very uh, simple uh, words which then um, turn out to form a very important expression, which is mutual respect. So we understand very well that every country can and must and do have national interest. And we always respect that. But in the meantime, in the meantime, we expect our friends, partners, to respect our national interests uh, as well. And um, we are happy that uh, since this administration has been in place, uh, the uh, mutual respect has uh, appeared again uh, in our bilateral relationship um, uh, with the US. We understand very well and we find it very legitimate that the current administration says America first and, uh, and acts accordingly. You know, when the President Trump won the election here, there was a huge, huge, huge hysteria in Europe. And even the foreign affairs ministers <coughs> were gathered of the European Union right after your elections for an extraordinary meeting to, uh, to address the situation. And there were only two of us, the current Prime Minister of the United Kingdom 
and myself not to attend, saying that uh, why should we judge the decision of another country, of the citizens of another country? And this is something what we expect uh, when it comes to the, um, when it comes to this, let's say, new world order, that uh, the uh, decisions of the citizens of respective countries must uh, be, um, must be uh, respected. And when it comes to uh, China, for example, you know we understand that uh, here um, the US media portrays us as uh, we were the uh, traitors and as we had the too tight relationship with China as if the Chinese, all Chinese investments um, coming to Europe would come to Hungary. To the contrary, what is the, what is the reality and the truth? We had 16 major investments which have arrived from China, 16. But 11 of the 16 are outcomes of global takeovers. When Chinese companies have bought the American, German, Canadian, or Swiss companies, and the German, American, Canadian, Swiss subsidiaries in Hungary became Chinese subsidiaries. So what can we do to it? Why do you sell your companies? Why do American, German, Swiss, or Canadian owners sell their own companies to the Chinese? This is the question. So it's not about a country, allow me to say that, which represents 1.3% of the EU-China trade. 1.3%. This is the share of Hungary. And you ask us whether we are on the table or on the menu. So I think you should start with yourself and with the big ones and put the question to yourself what you think about this new competition. Because when it comes to the, um, to, I mean, if I, if I follow the figures of your trade, for example, during the last 10 years, you have increased the uh, US-China trade by 62% and the US uh, exports to China by 72% in 10 years. And uh, when, it comes to, uh, when it comes to Europe, you know, Germans represent 28% of, uh, of China-EU trade. We do represent 1.3%. On the other hand, when it comes to Russia, we understand that uh, you must be black or white in this regard. I, I'll tell you the following. Uh, during the last three years, during the last three years, under the sanctions regime, the French have increased their trade with the Russians by 41%. The Germans have increased uh, their trade uh, with the Russians by 20%. The Irish by 108%. The Portuguese by 88%. So my question is, why you pose this question to the Central Europeans? Because as an outcome of the sanctions, what happened? The uh, smaller countries and companies of the smaller countries have been pushed out uh, from the Russian market. You know, the Russians uh, developed their own uh, replacement um, 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 industries and Big Western European companies made enormous businesses. And what we are speaking nowadays about, that you expect the Central Europeans, you know, to get rid of Russian influence when it comes to energy. But physically, it's impossible. Because there's no one to come to invest in infrastructure which would enable us to be able to buy uh, gas uh, from US, from LNG source, for example, because there's no infrastructure for that, you know? And when you ask us whether we are on the team or not when it comes to Russia, well, 100% of our gas import comes from Russia. Why? Because ExxonMobil has not made their final investment decision whether we can buy gas from Romania. Croatians haven't built their LNG port in Croatia. And from the north, we cannot buy any kind of uh, gas out of Russian uh, source because the German Czech and the Czech Slovak interconnectors have been booked by Gazprom. This is the European reality. So I mean, posing questions from here, thousands of miles away, is very easy. But we in, in Central Europe, you know, we have a very clear understanding of history. Whenever East and West had a conflict, we always lost. And we, didn't want, we don't want to be losers again. Let me just follow up um, on that. Thank you for making such powerful points. And as an economist, can I also just commend you for having the actual numbers? Because it always adds a nice... Um, I supervise trade as well. So yeah, you know. it's, it's very good. Well, <laughs> Um, I, um, I urge everyone to follow your, follow, follow, follow your example. Um, but if we, if we look at the, um, you know, I think you've sketched the outlines of the problem very clearly. So what's the solution? What do we do? You have a, these, this unfinished business in the energy infrastructure with the political consequences that go with it. Um, two years ago, we saw a tremendous American effort behind the Three Cs initiative, high level American representation in Bucharest, and everyone was very optimistic, and they said this is going to be a big pushback against the 16 plus one, which is the Chinese-run sort of infrastructure beauty contest, and three seas, Baltic, Black Sea, Adriatic, this is going to be the new 
um, the new framework for sorting these problems out. And the C th three Cs has pretty much fizzled. Not much happened in Slovenia earlier this year. I don't know who, even who's in charge. I mean, is that the sort of forum in which we could get the Kirk LNG terminal built, in which we could get the interconnectors built, in which we could get the um, changes in the um, other bits of the energy infrastructure that we need? Um, and if it isn't that, then please say what should happen. Give us a positive, mm -hmm. a positive solution. Look, I was the one to represent uh, Hungary on the last three seas initiative summit in Slovenia. I think it took place sometimes in summer, if I remember uh, correctly. And there I made it very clear, as I can repeat here, three seas initiative will make sense if actions will follow the very nice words. Because, you know, speaking about uh, American LNG should have an important role in Central Europe, fine. But since we cannot import it in, on trains, um, we can say this uh, sentence, I don't know, 100 times a day, nothing will happen. So what should happen is that uh, you convince your, uh, one of the biggest energy companies of yours to uh, exploit the gas uh, from the offshore field in Romania. You convince the Croatians to build finally the LNG port and uh, deliver uh, LNG there. We're happy that our Polish friends are increasing you know, their capacities in their uh, LNG terminals. We need the missing link between uh, Poland and Slovakia uh, to be uh, completed, <coughs> and then we have a chance. But if it is only about nice words, sorry to say, it will not make sense. If actions follow the words, then it will make sense. And you know, when you speak about the 16 plus one cooperation between Central and Eastern part of Europe and China, I mean, I don't think you are looking for the opponent on the right place. Because 16 of us represent 9.9% of the EU-China trade. So we're not gonna be game changers in this regard, be, aware, be sure about that. And, and if we had cheaper sources from uh, Europe or from US, in order to, uh, to develop infrastructure, do you think we, could, uh, we would take uh, a more expensive source? Don't, don't look at us as stupid, you know. Uh, if, if there's a cheaper source, we take it. And we are mature enough, so you don't have to be afraid that we go into a, a debt trap because we just came out of it, so we don't want to you know, return. Uh, please offer cheaper sources. And if you offer cheaper sources, we cannot take them. Super, well, I, I, we're going to be moving on to a whole session on China at... 11 o'clock, and we also have a whole session on energy, so I don't want to steal um, too much of the content from those sessions, but you've given us plenty to think about, and I may follow up in the coffee break with a couple more, um, more points, but thank you very much. And, and also, if there's anyone here from Croatia or anyone here from the energy business or anyone who works on interconnectors or knows about um, other aspects of this, please feel free during the discussion to stick your hand up. We have a roving microphone, and we'll, you'll get a chance to um, ask a question or... Um, make a point. So I'd now like to turn to uh, Minister uh, State Secretary uh, František Ružička from Slovakia. Very glad to have you here at the forum. Um, and tell us how it looks from Slovakia. How are we going to empower the transatlantic relationship? How does Slovakia fit into these shifting patterns we see of economic and political interests? As a small country, you're particularly dependent on stable multilateral frameworks, and stable multilateral frameworks are not exactly the flavor of the month or the year, and possibly not even flavor of the decade. So, how does it look? No, thank you very much. And uh, really, listening to the discussion, to the statement of Mr. Petric, and also to Peter Siarto, I like the genius lots here of this building. I mean, someone said this is the second best address in Washington, D.C. So, I think that it's going to really inspire us a lot. In a, in a discussion, and I think that the both gentlemen here had a very strong points on, on what's going on and how we have to look at that. And um, well, the, the, the topic for our discussion today, unfinished business, you know, if we said that it is finished business, then we are all finished. So the thing is that, that we are finished as the, sa the same as the Roman Empire. I mean, we reach something that we cannot overcome and we will not be able to address. Because when you look, I mean, just a very short re retrospective. I mean, in 89, I mean, the biggest changes occurred in, in, in Europe since World War II that really totally changed the, the landscape and changed also the arrangement that, uh, that appeared and the division of Europe that appeared after the World War II. Then the decade of transition came. We all went through it with a great pain, quite a lot of investments, and we did it three times. I'm speaking on behalf of Slovakia, but it also refers to other countries that are here around the table. And nobody was really helping us in, in that. I mean, that was that we, were, we paid for the reconstruction and the re, uh, of the banks 8 billion euro from our own pockets. And it was no 
money from, from Europe from, for, for that. Then finally there came the decade of integration. We have finally reached the goal everybody wanted in Central and Eastern Europe. We were convinced that this is the way how we would like to live in EU and NATO. So then we expected the time of blooming, growing, friendship, democracy, freedoms. And all these three decades we did it together, US and Europe, Central Europe and the US. But really it happened afterwards. We went three, through several crises. That crisis, migration crisis. We went through the crisis of identity. We went to, through the crisis of, of what we would like to go farther. And in the meantime of this crisis, the new actors appeared, the new countries. There was the reestablishment of the power of, well, very, well, very much about China. The Russia started to regain, I mean, the, the territories they lost the decade before. The new countries were coming and the non-state actors appeared. Terrorism, ISIS. And today we are in a deep conflict with ourselves within. Minister Petricek mentioned the trade wars. Do we really need that? I mean, that's, I mean, we have to respect our differences. It's not that one is good and one is bad. We have to overcome the cracks that are there. And in the meantime also, there is a real war that is going on, which is the war in the cyberspace. And we don't realize it probably now so, so bluntly that these wars in the cyberspace are taking us apart. The Americans, Europeans, Europeans within, the Central Europeans and the Western Europeans. So if we don't pull together again, then we are going to lose that leadership we, we had after 1989 till 2004 or five. So where the Slovakia would like to stay here is that we would like to be a solid member of this cooperation. We would like to be a very deeply rooted in the cooperation, but what we need, and now very shortly just saying, the America first. We all are diplomats here. We all put our countries first when we are at the negotiating table. But the negotiation among the partners and friends is not about the divisions. It may be about differences, but not about the divisions. And when we overcome these differences, I mean, we can be again the leader, but otherwise we will lose to the investments of China taking over the Africa, the investments from Russia, not so big ones, but the investments to the small gains in the buffer zone around. So here where I see this, the, the place of, of Slovakia. Thank you very much for mentioning the technology and cyber, because I think there's sometimes a tendency that we look back at the old problems that, that we've had and try to work out how to solve them better. And we are not nearly as good at looking at through the, if you like, through the windshield at the problems that are coming towards us. Um, and working out how we're going to deal with those. So can you give us a, a little bit more, more detail on, on, on these issues of cybersecurity and on data protection? Well, there's very different views in Europe and in America. We, in America is quite rightly proud of its big technological giants. In Europe, where we don't have technological giants, we tend to see Facebook and Google as kind of threats that need to be regulated. We have a a much more sort of citizen-driven view of data, whereas in America it's much more about the relationship between the customer and the supplier. Um, how do you see this, 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 this going forward? What, what, what are we going to have to focus on, and what are the dif difficulties we're going to have to solve? No, what, what the problem is that for, when the, when the uh, internet came, and when the social networks were coming, when, when this kind of the huge boom of the information started to reach our minds, we saw that this is the advantage. We thought that this is something that can help us to overcome the educational gaps, that can help us to overcome the cultural differences, etc. And what we see today is totally contrary. And today, I mean, we are facing really the thing that, okay, what is the media and information freedom? And what is the misuse of these information resources and the networks against us? And you see it in the, in, a, in the manipulation. I mean, now the meddling with the elections results. 
<coughs> penetrating the international organizations' networks, getting information out from, the, from our databases in the United States or in, in, in Slovakia also, is becoming a sort of sport. And it's a very soft way how to weaken us. And the difference, of course, you probably, met, uh, you probably uh, focused on or, or referred to Europe taxing the big corporations. That's one economic part of issue, but what I'm talking about is rather the educational, mental, and information part of issue. That if we, United States and, and Europe, don't create the code of conduct and the way how to really maintain and keep the freedom of expression, information, and, and everything on one hand, and on the other hand, identify all the security strategic uh, weapons or, 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 or means that are used against us. Look at Brexit. One number changed the course of the history of the country. One number changed the course of the history of the relations between the UK and the European Union. Now everybody knows that number was taken out of the context. But the same may happen in the US, the same may happen in, in Europe. So this is my question. It's not about, okay, if you should tax it, if it should tax, the, you are economist, so you refer to the economic part. I'm more, more in the politics. I'm referring to the part of the strategic communication and, and using this kind of the huge power what we have in our hands for making our leverage and our advantage, bringing our ideas of the democracy freedoms to other, not vice versa, that they use the, these instruments we created against us. The number, if anyone is wondering, was this number on the side of the Brexit bus, which said we send £350 million a week, was it, to the um, European Union, let's spend it on the NHS instead. Of course, this was complete nonsense. It wasn't £350 million. That was a gross number, not a net number. And if we didn't spend it on that, we'd have to spend it on other things. We certainly wouldn't be able to spend it on the NHS. Um, so it was a, it managed to, con con I think it was a, a, a slogan that had more falsehoods in the slogan than it even had words. Um, but it was still very, as you say, very successful. I'd like to turn to Marcin Przydacz um, now from, um, from Poland. Um, it must, I think, it's easy to forget from the outside how much bigger Poland is um, than its neighbours. And um, Poles often um, are rather too polite to say this, but... You know, the other countries um, of Central and Eastern Europe, um, obviously with exception of Ukraine, you know, combined have a population about the size of, um, of, 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 of Poland. Um, you are the Under Secretary of State for Eastern Policy, Eco Economic Diplomacy and Development Cooperation, which is already three fascinating areas, and you combine them all at one, in, into one. But give us, give us, I mean, you, P Poland can act differently, it sees things differently, it has a different strategic culture. Give us your perspective on the unfinished business of 1989. Well, for, uh, first of all, thank you very much for the, for the invitation. It's my first time here at this, uh, at this very building and, 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 and this, uh, at this kind of um, uh, conference organized by um, uh, SIPA and congratulations on the organizing such a beautiful um, um, uh, event. Uh, um, there was a very interesting, I mean, there is a the, the, the very interesting topic, I mean, of this, of this uh, conference, unfinished um, 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 uh, business. I mean, I'm, I'm from the um, generation which had, hardly remember 80s. I was born in 80s, so, uh, you know, the democracy, um, free trade market, that is something very natural for, um, um, uh, for me. Uh, when we joined uh, NATO, I was... I was at the secondary school, so it was something very obvious for me being in the in a Western community. Let me uh, let me say so. My perspective would be a bit different, I would say, um, when it comes to the un um, unfinished business. I mean, we've done it. I mean, we um, uh, the whole Central Europe, let me say, is right now the part of the of the transatlantic Euro-Atlantic um, um, family uh, with a good economy, with a um, uh, with a stable democracy. Uh, but there are two things missing. One is geopolitics. There are still countries which are uh, on the other side. Uh, we, we wanted to overcome somehow the uh, Yalta uh, regime, but we didn't manage to, to succeed uh, fully. I mean, there are still uh, countries, I mean, obviously Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, 
that are willing to be a part of our of our club, and we have to fully support them, uh, even they, if they have um, um, yeah, some problems. But there is another unfinished business right in the center, um, the Central Europe. I mean, Peter already mentioned about the three C's initiative. I mean, that's 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 my perspective. I mean, we joined Western community, uh, and when it comes to the infrastructure, telecommunication infrastructure, roads, railways, everything is done on the east-west, really. When you want to go from Warsaw to Berlin, it takes like four hours, I think, by car. But when you want to go to Bucharest, it takes two days, uh, because there were only links built with the Western, um, uh, Western country. And that's why we launched this program. That's why we created the new initiative, uh, Three C's initiative, to, um, to somehow fill this, um, um, uh, this, gap, this gap, to finish this, um, uh, uh, this business, to, to have a stronger cooperation in the, um, uh, in the region, uh, since we have the same history, the same problems, the same challenges, uh, but we have to be also, I mean, united in this, um, uh, in this, uh, um, uh, in this region, and I'm pretty happy that the uh, United States are very present in this, in this initiative. I mean, President Trump was the guest uh, at, the, at the summit in Warsaw, uh, and of course, I mean, America plays a very important role in this, um, um, in this um, um, initiative since they are in, uh, the other Western partners are willing to be a, a part of this initiative as well. Uh, at the very beginning, they were not very friendly to, 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 to these kind of uh, ideas. Right now, they want to they wanna be with us, and that's, that's very okay, and that shows how powerful uh, the transatlantic bond is. I mean, it's just, you know, when you, when you create something uh, on two sides of the, of the ocean, then it's, um, it's a kind of uniting, uniting um, uh, idea. So to, to, to finish that business, we have to, we have to carry on, on working uh, with, our, with our Eastern partners. And as you, uh, as you mentioned, I mentioned my, my portfolio, also through the development projects, why not? Also through the, the, the economic diplomacy, um, you know, to work on the, on the economy of Ukraine or, or Georgia, um, to help them somehow to b build um, the economy based on uh, small and medium business. That's, that's, uh, that's our success. That's what we've done in, in Poland, Hungary, Czech, uh, and Slovakia. Uh, for now, as we know, all their, I mean, the economy is a bit different uh, with, the, with the oligarchic system. And through the development projects, we can do it, of course. We can do it um, uh, also by, 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 by implementing new, um, uh, new projects. And the second thing, just to repeat, um, uh, to unite uh, the, the region. That would be my answer to your question. So what can you say to um, Minister Siarto, who wants to know why can't Hungary buy LNG gas import in Poland? What specifically needs to change and who's going to make it change? Okay. First, we have to, of course, build an infrastructure, and we are doing this. Um, we, started, we started the LNG f uh, terminal. We have, a, we have a good contract with, uh, with the states, but not only with, the other, with other partners. Um, uh, we need interconnectors, uh, and that's the way it should be done. I mean, we are all dependent on Russian energy sources, uh, and with the Nord Stream 2, Nord Stream 2 it will be even, even um, worse. So my preference would be to, uh, to create our own, own infrastructure to, to, uh, to be less dependent rather than um, building, for example, um, power, power plants together with, uh, with, uh, with uh, Russian partners. That's, I mean, that would, be, that would not definitely help uh, to be independent in that matter. Thanks very much indeed. Um, I'm, we're moving on to questions in a moment, so start sharpening your wits and your phrasing for making a point. I see one, one there already. The microphone will come to you um, in a moment. Well, who's got the microphones? I'm looking for the microphone carriers. Um, well, when the microphone carriers arrive, we have a, um, someone in the front row there, and then we have a lady there and someone there. But let me just ask you a bit more about Ukraine, because Poland has taken a, it was the point country for dealing with um, Ukraine, and we've seen a, you know, the terrible um, human cost of the of the war, the occupation of Crimea, the insurgency, Russian-backed um, um, attacks on Donbass, and now this um, you know, extraordinary change in Ukraine with a completely new, or seemingly completely new political force, a new Rada with an average age of, I think, under 30, if I, read, um, if I remember right. Um, so I'm happy with that. Complete change of political, political class in Ukraine. 
Um, one of, and, you know, in Poland, with its very close ties to, to, to Ukraine, um, is in an excellent position to tell us um, what to make of this. Um, what should we be doing? What are the opportunities? Do you see any threats? What's, what's up in Ukraine? Uh, okay. First of all, I mean, let's, let's see what happened in Ukraine. I mean, uh, after the Maidan, there was, a, there was, of course, the government of President Poroshenko, and it took only a couple of years um, to ch I mean, to, 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 for Ukrainians to change their minds uh, um, totally. I mean, they are still pro-European. Uh, they are still, I think, pro-Euro-Atlantic, but not with this uh, particular um, uh, government. They've just chosen another, another, another government, another president with the um, 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 huge majority, uh, and that means that uh, that's the. Um, 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 on the, on the, on the, there's a huge obligation also on me on the on the new uh, on the on the on the, on the go, new government. There are huge expectations of the of the um, Ukrainian um, uh, people. They really want to live in a better better world, better country. Um, uh, we know that because almost two millions of Ukrainians are right now in Poland, um, working working very hard because they wanna wanna have a, a better future. They couldn't um, find a good job in their, in their country, they couldn't, they couldn't uh, um, you know, finally see um, uh, reforms uh, which, are, which, are, um, which are very, very, very needed. So that's, uh, that's the job to be done and, and, and the, the time is very short. So, I mean, Mr. Zelensky, he has to start right now. Uh, otherwise, he will lose very, um, uh, very, 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 very soon. That so his, his star may fall as quickly as it rose. As I said, I mean, yeah, really, yeah. I mean... But, Mr. Seattle, let me just quickly come to you, because I know there's a particularly difficult relationship um, between um, Hungary and Ukraine on the issue of the Hungarian language and the Hungarian minority. It's not a new problem. I remember um, Prime Minister Orban at Globsec just after Maidan already saying he was not optimistic about developments there. Um, do you see a chance for a, a reset in um, Ukrainian-Hungarian relations under Mr. Um, Zelensky? And can you share perhaps to uh, many people in the audience and watching will be mystified why um, Hungary seems to have such particularly difficult relations with mm. Ukraine. Just cast a brief light on that and then we'll get to questions. You know, we are, um, we are really uh, crossing fingers for the new president to be able to deliver because he has said very nice words, but here again the same, actions must follow the words. The uh, former regime led by President Poroshenko has uh, taken away uh, many rights from the minorities, including the Hungarians, when it comes to access of um, education, uh, culture, public administration, on the, on the mother tongue, you know, on the own language. And the only thing what we expect from the current um, uh, administration, which uh, enjoys uh, full support in parliament as being in a majority, to give back those rights which were taken away. So we do not, uh, we do not um, um, ask for anything special. We do not ask for anything additional. What we ask for is give back those rights which were taken away by the former um, administration. This is what we expect. And uh, immediately after they do it, we immediately are ready to, um, to lift the, our veto on the NATO-Ukraine Commission uh, to be convened. But until, until this happens, um, you know, we, can, uh, we cannot um, make any change either. So it's very, very clear, nice words on behalf of Ukraine, readiness from our side, and actions must be made. I'm struck by the fact you used the word regime for President Poroshenko's administration. But okay, let's just leadership, sorry. Well, well, you, we'll, 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 both, both words are noted. Um, okay, question here. And if you, I, mean, I recognize quite a few people here, but not everyone. So can you introduce yourself sure. and then come with your question? All right, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Jan Zdralek. I'm a graduate student at the Johns Hopkins, Johns Hopkins University, SICE. Um, I want to take a little different perspective, maybe more hopeful, <laughs> coming back to Minister Petricek's um, speech. Um, so my parents were there in 1989 uh, during the Velvet Revolution at the Wenceslas Square in Prague. And now I feel that's kind of their business finished, but then there is a new generation of people like me, <laughs> 25, 30 years old, who now I see Czechs, I see Slovaks, I see Hungarians and Poles crossing the ocean, coming to the U.S., working in the U.S., studying in the U.S. I see Americans um, coming to Central and Eastern Europe to study and work. So I see this sort of a cultural exchange 
um, as a good sign mm -hmm. of a you know transatlantic future. So I was wondering if you guys would agree with that. Um, with that well, it'd, be, it'd, be, it'd be hard to disagree with that. Right, uh, this right. is a, a, a good thing. Um, do right. you have a, you have a specific bring question? A little more positive, um, let's say, feedback to your presentation because I felt we were getting to difficult places. So, um, right. if you could highlight maybe some of the some of the um, let's say cultural exchanges the countries of Central Eastern Europe do with the United States, that would be great. Thanks very much. And then there was um, a lady over there. And um, can, the can we get the microphone? Can you stand up, please, ma'am, so we can uh, see you? And we'll take a couple more. Yes, go ahead. And if you could introduce yourself. Good morning. I'm Christina Perkin Davison, co founder of iEurope Capital, a venture capital fund that invests in Central Europe, and we've been inv investing for many years now. I have a question for Minister Siato, Yona Potkivana. Um, and uh, I have been very, very positive about all the incredible technologies that have been coming out of Central Europe for years. Uh, we've been investing in them. And I've been uh, extremely um, delighted that, pri that um, President Trump invited uh, Prime Minister Orban uh, this spring to the White House, which uh, was long overdue in my opinion. And so I think that it's very important to talk about uh, what has come out of that and uh, what do you see for the future of this stronger relationship uh, between our two countries, which is, in, in, as a businesswoman, I think that is the binding way to go forward. That's what unites us. Thank you. Very good. And there was a question just next. It was, uh, yes, can you just pass the microphone to the man just next to you, I think? Yes, stand up, sir, so we can see you. Okay, I'll, okay I'll you go first. Yeah. Fine. Uh, my name is Radu Mihail. I'm the vice chairman of the uh, Foreign Affairs Committee in the Romanian, Par in the Romanian Senate. And the question would be for, uh, for Mr. Ziarto. Um, I was puzzled by your remark that uh, one huge priority is cheaper sourcing when referring to uh, opportunities brought by 16 plus 1. And um, my grandfather had a, had a saying. He was saying, if you're um, poor, you don't buy uh, cheap shoes. Um, did you evaluate the effect of this policy of cheap sourcing today on the long-term evolution of the region and of Hungary, of course? And how do you see the involvement uh, in, in comparison with 16 plus 1 and with the Three Seas Initiative from, from a Hungarian perspective and from a Visegrad perspective? Thank you. Okay, so um, it's a lot of... It's just, I hope you find this flattering, Mr. Seattle. Everyone is firing questions at you, but the... Um, Something on the, um, the, the Trump, uh, uh, Orban, President Trump, Prime Minister Orban meeting, which was a very big deal, not just for Hungary, but for all of Central Europe. Um, and uh, everyone was very pleased about that. But if you can give us any sort of um, practical readout about that, um, what we should look for the future of business ties, would be very interesting. Um, and then this, um, the question about what's cheap today may be expensive tomorrow, um, and the contrast between three C's and 16 plus one would be interesting. And then I'm going to turn back to Minister Petrocek to ask him if he can be a little bit more optimistic. <laughs> Based on the question of the young man there. Go ahead, Mr. Seattle. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, when it comes to the uh, meeting between your president and uh, our prime minister, I have to tell you that there was chemistry from the very, very first second. The, um, the tete -a tete which was almost a tete -a tete since John, John Bolton and myself were included, uh, was planned to um, take 10 minutes, then it, it took uh, around 45. And, um, and they, have, um, they have talked a lot about the situation uh, in Central Europe, relationship to Russia, and the impact of uh, China on the region, of course. They have spoken a lot about one very important common point, which I, I consider as one of the most important ones, and this is our, our joint efforts to protect the uh, Christian communities all over the world. Because uh, you will find just a very limited uh, number of countries which are ready, and, and some of them sit on the table, oh, sorry, on the podium now, um, that which are ready and brave enough to speak about this issue openly, that Christianity is the most persecuted religion all over the world, and we Christian countries do have the uh, obligation or responsibility to protect them. So they have uh, spoken a lot uh, about that. On the other hand, they have spoken a lot about border protection and migration, of course. Since, you know, we have a very strong anti-migration policy, um, basically all four of us, but, uh, um, but let's say we are rather loud than not. So uh, we, we preserved our right to make a decision on our own 
whom we let enter the territory of our country and whom we do not let enter the territory of our country. We uh, preserve our right to make a decision with whom we are ready to live together with and with whom not. So I think this is another very important um, uh, common point that protection of the borders, protection of security of the nation, protection of the security of the people is something very high on the agenda. So if anybody understands uh, your president uh, willing to build a wall on the border uh, on the south, it's us because we have built a very strong fence on our southern border in order to stop the migratory flows and together with the assistance of the Visegrad <coughs> countries, since they all have sent police and, uh, and military forces to our southern border, we were able to prove that yes, illegal migratory flows are stoppable. And when it comes to economy, look, we have 17,000 Sorry, 1,700, it would be great. 1,700 US-based companies operating in Hungary. They employ 105,000 people. Now it seems to be peanuts from a US perspective, but in Hungary it's a big deal because following the Germans, US investors form the second largest um, uh, investing group and we are very uh, happy with that. And you also take advantage of the fact that you have to pay the lowest tax rates of Europe in Hungary given the fact that we have uh, um, uh, flat tax both on personal and corporate income, 9% and 15%, which is uh, pretty um, uh, attractive and uh, one of the outcome of this um, good economic cooperation between US and Hungary and one of the outcomes of very low taxes is that uh, in the first half of this year Hungary had the biggest economic growth in Europe uh, which was 5.1%. So we build on this uh, very strong relationship and the success stories uh, which constitute of Microsoft, IBM, BlackRock, uh, Honeywell, uh, General Electric. Uh, so uh, we, we really will continue on that. On the other hand, what is cheap and, and what is expensive? So I think that there's, you know, I mean, you should look at us as mature persons and mature nations, all right? So don't look at us as children. We would never make a decision which would, um, we, which would bring risk or negative impact on us. So your question to me, whether we have evaluated long-term um, uh, perspective as well, so what do you think? A leadership of a country wouldn't put into consideration long-term perspective? Come on, <laughs> this, is, this is number one issue which you have to put into uh, consideration, of course. And you know, I mean, speaking about uh, China as, uh, you know, as, uh, as selling cheap things, I mean, come on, what is the reality? The speed and pace of the uh, change of global economy when it comes to technology is dictated by East at least as much that as it's dictated by the West. So there are very modern technologies uh, coming out um, uh, from uh, China. Otherwise, they wouldn't be competitive. Otherwise, they wouldn't uh, have a $660 billion trade with the United States in, in, in one year. So uh, I think we should be more respectful, respectful uh, than that. But on the other hand, but on the other hand, my question is, why should we make a pick? Why should I choose between the free season initiative and the 16 plus one? Why should I do it? We are, we are here all members of Visegrad 4, we are all here um, involved in the Free Seas Initiative, and we are all here involved in 16 plus 1. So the days are over when you have to make a pick whether you want this or that. So uh, we have, uh, we have um, uh, uh, launched a strategy on, on trade policy that we want to stand on both of our feet especially under such uh, windy weather, when if you stand only on one foot, you're gonna be blown away by the wind. You have to stand on both feet. And why shouldn't be, we be ready to trade uh, with the Chinese, with the Japanese, with the Koreans, just like with the Americans and with the, with, the, um, with the other European countries? Well, thank you very much for that. And I'm sure anyone who's watching who is following the terrible persecution of Christians in communist-run mainland China will be extremely glad to know that they have hungry at their side, so thank Absolutely. you, thank, thank you for that. Um, Mr. Petrushek. Um, I'm, I'm optimistic, uh, I know that uh, there is more that connects us uh, with US and Canada than uh, divides us. Uh, in fact, uh, 1.5 million American citizens have uh, Czech roots. I think that uh, what else is there than uh, people uh, people connections. Uh, and I, I'm really glad that uh, Prague is becoming home for more and more Americans, and not only because of cheap beer, but because of a uh, uh, good job, and uh, that's something we should, uh, we should really cherish, that uh, we became, over the last 30 years, attractive destination f for people from Canada, from United States, or from all around uh, Europe, 
uh, to live, to work, uh, uh, to study uh, in our countries. It only proves that uh, our transformation and transition over the past three decades <coughs> has uh, uh, brought us uh, good results. Uh, if I may just uh, add to it uh, the economic dimension, I, I fully agree that uh, uh, trade, business to business, is something that also connects us. And uh, I'm happy that uh, it's not only Americans investing in our part of the Europe, it's also increasingly our companies investing here in the U US, creating jobs here in areas like uh, defense industry, labels, medicine, healthcare, that's uh, financial services. So I think that it's, uh, it's showing that our relations are becoming more mature, uh, that are bringing uh, benefits for both sides. So um, I only would like to stress that uh, we would like to work together with our American partners on uh, further strengthening and fostering our economic cooperation. For my country, US is uh, the biggest trading partner outside of the Europe. So it, it's only nature that uh, we look for opportunities and uh, uh, I believe that our trade is based on uh, good understanding that uh, we, have, uh, we have a very similar approach to what doing business, not like uh, with China probably. And uh, if I may, may just add very briefly on, a, on a, uh, not buying the cheap, uh, we all are discussing 5G right now and, uh, and just to, to think about uh, not buying cheap, if we in five years find out that uh, there is a bug, it will be three times more expensive to get uh, rid of the bug. Uh, than, uh, to in, than the upfront investment. Uh, so just to think uh, strategically in long-term perspective, uh, it is 5G. Uh, if we want, we'll be forced to replace some technologies, it will be much, much more expensive than uh, upfront investment. On, on that note, I would, anyone who's interested in 5G and Huawei, I would very strongly recommend reading the um, report by um, Britain's GCHQ, which is the counterpart to the American NSA, and they have a, a, a unit which examines the uh, um, Huawei technology, and they publish an annual report um, on how reliable it is. They don't um, make anything about, say anything about trapdoors and backdoors and things like that. They just write about the in integrity of the design and the way the hardware and the software fit together. And I have to say, having read, they, they come out every year, and every year Huawei promises to improve, and every year, ne next year, the report comes out with more problems. And if you're thinking about 5G, it's, I think, well worth reading that before you bet your country's um, Internet of Things infrastructure on that, uh, on that technology. Uh, Minister, you want to say something? Well, thank you very much. Just for the optimism and pessimism and the middle age crisis, mid-age crisis, <laughs> You know, in your age, probably, I was in Prague uh, witnessing the visits of the then Secretary General of NATO, Manfred Werner, John Major coming, George Bush coming to Prague, and Margaret Thatcher, and other leaders, and uh, they were the leaders with a vision. They were seeing much farther than one election cycle. They saw us becoming the members of the European Union, NATO, etc., and we, we did that, thanks to the help of them. Now, after that, I mean, this kind of the fatigue came with the Middle Age, and I can, of course, advise Mr. Minister Petricek because I'm somewhere in the middle of that. <laughs> I'm happy married, I'm glad and happy with my family, I'm happy with us being in the EU and NATO, but what I see where the unfinished business is, that, that we sort of like fall on the sleep of that everything is fine, and we are not seeing I mean, a lot of issues that were tackled here, 16 plus one, three seas initiative, China expansion, Russia hybrid wars. We don't see those ones that if we are going to be looking inward us only to see our own problems, trade wars or the differences what we have. As we see, there is a lot of focus here on the discussions with some of the Central European countries and our neighbors. Then we probably lose the momentum to stay and remain the leaders of the free, free world. We are not anymore as attractive. And that's important from you, I mean, as a new leaders, that too, that we again see not only the tactical politicians, that see only what is happening tomorrow, but that we see the visionary politicians. And that's, for example, also for the question of the climate change. 
we are speaking about the 30 years for the, for the carbon neutrality, which is 30 years there, 30 years back. What can happen in 30 years? In 30 years, we can live on a totally devastated planet. Or we can live in a totally flourishing planet with the renewable sources of energy, with the, with the hybrid cars, with the electric cars, etc. But we have to get it together because US and Europe are the world leaders in the technologies and should remain that. Super, let's have some more questions. Um, where are the microphones? Yes, go ahead, sir, and then offer out the microphone, Nick, other microphone here, please. Go Thank ahead. Thank you very much. My name is Marek Swiecinski, and I come from uh, uh, Politica Insights Center for Policy Analysis in Warsaw, Poland. And thank you, Ed, and distinguished ministers for this superb Central European uh, panel. I would like to uh, turn your, your attention to another event which is happening in New York, which is the meeting of uh, Poland's and US presidents, uh, Andrzej Duda and Donald Trump, signing another declaration on enhanced US presence, military presence in, in Poland. And uh, therefore, I would like to um, uh, ask for your um, um, assessments of what, what needs to be, to be done on the military end of finishing businesses. Is what has happened uh, um, so far enough? What needs to be done more? How we, Central Europeans, can make this Atlantic resolve uh, be uh, uh, stronger? Thank you very much. Thanks very much indeed. And then go ahead, sir, and then we'll have a question from the second row. Uh, yeah, on the uh, theme of uh, unfinished business uh, in my studies at the University of Montana, uh, I de delved into the uh, history of NATO-Russia relations, and I feel like there's, uh, there was a potential for NATO to actually integrate Russia and you know, lead to uh, a very different uh, European security apparatus. Uh, do you feel the same that there was uh, a missed opportunity there and that there is a, uh, a potential if slash when a democratic Russia returns, because of course Putin's not going to be around forever, uh, if there's going to be a potential uh, second round of expansion or further round of expansion towards Russia to integrate them into the European security? Right, well, that's a, a very brave question in this room. Should Russia be brought into NATO? Um, can we have the microphone two, two rows forward, please? Just pass um, Michał Baranowski, uh, director of GMF Warsaw office. Um, I was uh, struck by the speech of, of Peter uh, Doran, um, who highlighted the question for, for the forum. Do we want to live in the future that is determined by Xi Jinping and Putin on one hand, or is it future that is determined by, uh, by the democratic uh, West? Um, and, and Minister, I was struck with the contrast with what you said but I wanted to get your view on this idea that we that Hungary should be standing with both uh, both feet, looking to the to the west and to the east. So my question, if this is if this is the right understanding, my question to you is: to what extent, in uh, Hungary's relations with other allies, should we look at the nature of the domestic regimes, uh, Putin, Xi Jinping, uh, versus United States, and whether Hungary wants to have equally close relationship uh, with, with those partners. And to other ministers, if you wish to uh, address it, how do you see this question of, uh, of uh, having relations with Russia and China and the United States at the time of this global competition, whether, whether you, you are seeking something of a balance or whether we have to, in fact, choose our camps? Thanks. Well, we've got three excellent questions there. On the military one, I would point out that this afternoon we have a whole session on the future of warfare with um, two, uh, two generals on the panel and a third general moderating. Um, so we'll save most of the discussion, I suspect, for, for then. But um, let's go. Uh, I'd like to ask all the panelists just for a, a, sort of a couple of bullet points on the military um, future. In, um, in, in this, this part of Europe. And then this very interesting question about Russia, because one can argue, as the Russians do, that the 1990s was a terrible mistake because we are too tough on Russia. You can also make the argument that the 1990s were a terrible mistake because we dropped our guard and we should have been much more um, concerned and we should have listened to the warnings of the countries like Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Ukraine and others who are warning us even back then that things are going in the wrong direction. And then thirdly, this very interesting question of values and how much values matter. Are we in a moving into a kind of values-blind era where what really matters are 
economic interests and security interests. Um, that's particularly under the lens with regard now to NATO's relationship with Turkey. Um, or are we still trying to uphold the values-based foreign policy, which was so important in the um, and central in the 1990s? So let me start. I'm going to go from left to right. Mr. Seattle, start starting with you. Do values still matter? Sorry, do? Do values still matter? Of course. Values matter on the first place. That's uh, no question. Uh, but I think you misunderstood me, because when I was speaking about standing on our both feet, I was speaking about trade and economic relations. We as a member of NATO, we as a member of uh, European Union, we as a country, troops of which have been serving together with uh, US troops and troops from other uh, allies in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in, uh, in Kosovo, in Bosnia-Herzegovina, uh, I think it's obvious uh, where we do belong to. We are a NATO and EU member state, but what we see is that our NATO and EU allies are making uh, tremendous businesses with countries where the, uh, let's say, the political structure is pretty much different than ours. And I wonder whether you pose this uh, question to the German and the French leaders, whether you pose it to the German leader who met 12 times uh, with, with the Russian president, whether you pose this question to the French president who made a statement uh, after his last meeting with President Putin that he will pay an official visit next May to Russia to take part on the, you know, on the uh, celebration, or whether you, uh, you raise this uh, question uh, after the mm -hmm. German and the French leaders meet the Chinese leaders to sell them 300 Airbus aircrafts. So I mean, why do I have the feeling that you always want the small ones uh, to, uh, to raise uh, these uh, issues and uh, why you don't ask the big ones how it is possible that they uh, conclude deals of billions and tens of billions of euros and dollars okay. when they meet the representatives of those countries which have totally different structure and totally different views about democracy than we do. Uh, so I think level okay. playing fields and uh, leaving a double standards and leaving hypocrisy behind would be extremely important. And on Russia, did we get Russia wrong in the 1990s? Look, we are a small Central European country. Um, once we had a country called Soviet Union as our neighbor, we had to suffer 40 years under a communist uh, regime, which was tolerated by, you know, by the world, basically. And we had to fight for our freedom for decades in order to be free again, you know. So uh, it was our desire to... Uh, basically to reoccupy our place uh, in NATO and, and re-enter uh, our place in the, in the community of the, of the democratic and free uh, countries, you know. So, uh, but we as a Central European country, we have learned the lesson of history, which was that whenever there was a conflict between East and West, the small Central European countries have always lost. Look at our histories. So when we say that we are interested in a more, let's say, uh, pragmatic or a better or a more efficient cooperation between East and West, we don't say it because we would be spies of Putin or spies of the Russians or whatever. We say it because this is our national interest. This is our national security interest to have a better relationship between East and West because the better the relationship between East and West is, the more secure our situation in Central Europe is. Minister Ruzicka, does, th does that echo with you? We see opinion polls in Slovakia that show that many Slovaks are pretty sceptical about NATO, and if there was a conflict between the um, America and um, Russia, that they would prefer Slovakia to be neutral, at least not, um, not, not on the American side. Do you, do you feel we've got that Central Europe has a different perspective on Russia, or do you think that Central Europe is part of the West and has the Western perspective on Russia? Definitely, Central Europe is a part of the West, I think, and uh, that was what, uh, what, we, what we demonstrated on several occasions. Well, you said the several, some bullet points. Sometimes I have a feeling from these discussions that we would like rather to go to see the bullet of a Broadway movie just to get some relax on, <laughs> on some issues. But really, let, let me very, be very brief on the military cooperation. I think that in the NATO, yes, it's true that out of the four Visegrad four countries in Slovakia is the lowest uh, approval rate for the NATO membership, but it has a long, quite long of, of the history, which we can go along. Also, I mean, speaking about 
uh, some views from even from the dissident circles, from the Christian dissident circles that were uh, that were advocating, for example, the Pan-Slavic Union, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I would say that now we are very, very deeply anchored in the in the NATO cooperation, in in in, in the understanding of where need, why we need NATO. Uh, for, for our security. And also, I mean, it is proven by our standing commitment to fulfill the obligation of 2% uh, contributions to the budget uh, on, the, on the military expenses. Also, modernization of the, of the armed forces by the F-16 and by, by the Black Hawks. So there is, there is this thing that, that in the long term run, I think that we are very deeply on the NATO side. On the Russia, your question and really uh, honest and open answer to, to if you got Russia wrong in the 90s, I would say yes. And uh, just the two things, uh, in, after 19, 1991, after the fall of the Soviet Union and, and the creation of the independent republics and, and states there, uh, I've heard from, uh, maybe, maybe I mean, I will not meet the agreement from many of the, of the uh, participants here, but I've heard from many of my friends from the United States that that the education about the Russian history, culture, politics, diplomacy simply disappeared from the American universities. So after 20 years when Russia rebounced in the world and global politics, we don't have the people who would really understand what Russia is up to and who really will not underestimate that they have some power what they can do. So the thing is, yes, we did it wrong because we start and we lost the strategic vision or where the Russian may go in 10, 15 years because we thought that the game is over. But the game was far from over. And when we are saying that, uh, Slovakia saying, well, it's not that we are not uh, pro-NATO, but we are saying it that don't underestimate it. And we saw it in Ukraine. Very two things on the values. We entered and we were entering European Union based on the values. I mean, when, when it was created, when the European uh, cooperation on the steel and uh, coal and steel was created. It was on the economics, but it was also on the value. It was on the value of the peace after the World War II. And then it developed to the values that we have to respect the rule of law, that we have to respect democracy, that we have to respect the free market, that we have to respect civil society, that we have to respect the media freedom. The thing is that if we don't do that, then we lose our battle, and then we, lo we leave our business unfinished of transatlantic cooperation. So that's where our strongest bond has to be. Not the economies. Of course, someone is gaining in trade, someone is losing. But we, if we compromise values, then we lose all. And trade doesn't matter. Thank you very much indeed for making that really important point that trade is the, it fundamentally is the product of a good political relationship and rules-based order. Try doing trade in Somalia and you'll see how difficult it is when you don't have the political and legal structures right. And thank you also for making that point about the um, analytical and linguistic and cultural expertise in Russia. And that was one of the really shocking things about the 1990s, was the way in which the, not only in um, the academic world, um, but also in government, we were firing all the time people from um, our different government agencies and ministries who were Russia experts because we thought they weren't needed anymore. Now we're hiring them back again. Um, Minister Petrichek, you're, that's not a reproach to the Czech foreign minister, which has always had excellent um, expertise on Russia. But give us a few thoughts on the military side, on values, and on whether we should have done anything different with regard to Russia policy. On military side, uh, first of all, I really believe we shouldn't stuck only with the military. That uh, there is much more uh, we need to do, and. Uh, I think that uh, this week uh, in New York is only uh, symbolic because uh, the problems we are facing together are not only about tanks, troops, missiles. This is part of the story, but the, the whole story is that uh, we are facing challenges that uh, cannot be uh, solved by tanks. And uh, I believe that uh, we should avoid the situation that uh, we are holding a hammer and everything is a nail. Uh, rather, we should uh, look for, uh, for tailored cooperation for specific problems. Um, on Russia, uh, if I may, I, I think this is much more for the historians than, uh, than politicians to, to say what, uh, what, ha what went wrong, but uh, uh, I would only uh, echo words of uh, one of uh, the writers uh, 
who wrote about the region and said that the, uh, Russia was not mentally able to join uh, NATO because uh, Russia never gave up its military perspective, uh, its, uh, its imperial perspective. So, so maybe one, one thought for the, for the debate. On values, uh, to some extent I don't agree with Peter. I think we are not somewhere in between West and East. I think we are West. And I, I'm really convinced that we are West. Uh, if, uh, if I look at our history, we have Western Christianity, we have Renaissance, we have Baroque, we have uh, Enlightenment, uh, we have uh, national movements that are very typical for the West. Uh, so I think that uh, all historical moments, trends, developments have been always linked to uh, what we call West. And uh, frankly, I think that uh, we in Central Europe should keep our specific uh, understanding of our identity as Scandinavians, uh, uh, people from Mediterranean have, but uh, uh, I don't think that uh, people in Norway or Sweden question whether they are West or not. Uh, they are clearly part of the West. And uh, that's my understanding. And uh, as my wife always says, uh, okay, do the business with whomever you want, but you have to remember that home is here and always return back to home. Thanks very much for making that point. I think the whole idea of the West is very slippery and it's uh, always interesting to talk to the Finns who are far to the east of everywhere that's called West, but also very determined mm -hmm. that their geographical easternness doesn't mean that they're any less Western. Um, I'm always saying that Prague is more to the West than, also, than Vienna. Prague is the West of Vienna. It was a slogan from my childhood, which I learned even before I knew where those two cities were on a map. <laughs> um, so, um, um, Martin uh, Pridac, uh, give, us, give us thoughts from, from Poland. You're actually maybe getting a, 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 an American military base of some kind, yes, possibly Fort Trump, possibly under some other name. Okay. Three short comments on a, on a military presence. Of course, we are uh, pleased with the fact that uh, the, the, the current number of, of American soldiers will, uh, will, will grow by the, um, about 1,000 of, of, of uh, uh, additional um, U.S. soldiers. And that, that, let me come back to the, to the first question about the, the slogan, I mean, the, about the American, America first, right? I mean, that's, I mean, how would, you, how would you refer to, to that? I mean, America first, but in the same moment, this particular administration, they are sending more troops to, um, uh, to the Central, Central Europe. Because, I mean, America first doesn't mean that uh, America alone or only America, right? That's, um, yeah, that's the, the, I, will, I will subscribe what, 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 to what, uh, what Thomas, um, yeah, Thomas said. I mean, if you are the leader of a country, what, 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 what would you say? I mean, America the last or the second or the third? Of course, the, the first. Like, I mean, for me, Poland is the first, and, and from, for, for, from, for, for, for Thomas, the uh, Czech Republic is first, right? But anyway, I mean, they found a kind of common interest in uh, being um, in presence uh, in the central, um, uh, central Europe, and then and, and, and common interest not only uh, between Poland and the U.S., but I think for, for the whole, for the whole um, uh, region. When it, when it comes to the, to the values, of course, we are all fueled by values. Without values, we are just, I think, animals. I mean, without values, we couldn't, we couldn't have created a um, solidarity movement, for example, in the 80s in Poland. Or uh, what, would, what, what, what would be um, Maidan without um, uh, values? I mean, it's all fueled by, uh, by the whole... Uh, political life, I think, is fueled by. Um, it's not only the interest; it's, uh, there is something, uh, something more. And just a uh, brief comment on, on, on Russia. I still believe, to be honest, uh, in the Russian society. I mean, I, I still believe that there is uh, some kind of power in the society um, uh, of, of Russia. We just need to help them somehow to be more uh, more active. We've seen a bit. I mean. Uh, recent uh, um, uh, protests, and then that there are some leaders. Uh, we just need to work on the on the on the on the civil society there, uh, not only on a political level with the with the with those gentlemen of uh, Kremlin, but also down there um, with the with the society. I mean, that's that would be the task for the future. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much indeed for for that. I've been thinking about this America, America first. And I think it, it sounds, it's a lot easier from an ally's point of view if you, don't make, if you make that the beginning of the sentence, but not the sentence um, alone. So it's America first to help, America first to fight, America first to speak up, 
to stand up America as the leader of the West. That sounds much better than just America first on its own. So I think it should be America first with some dots afterwards, and then you can fill in, um, in, fill, fill in, fill in things um, afterwards. Um, we're almost at the end. We have time for one very quick question, if there was one. Um, just gentlemen here. I hope this is going to be a, a, a quickie. Yeah, go ahead, sir. Uh, my name is Max Pejour. I'm a director with the Energy Policy Research Foundation at Brink. Uh, the minister from Hungary made a statement that he can't import LNG. And I was curious if this was a, an issue of language, a nuance of language, whether or not it's a matter of ability. So I'd like to highlight a prototype project that we have here in the United States called the Florida East Coast Railway, which runs from Miami up to the Port Everglades. Uh, their locomotives, all their locomotives run on LNG. And uh, it's just one more kick to it. It's, it's, a, it's a railway that's owned by a Mexican conglomerate, a class one business. So it's, it's very much, you're very much able to do that if that was what your statement was about. So just to be clear, this is a railway where the locomotives run on LNG. It's LNG as a they, fuel. They, they, they can run on diesel. They have the diesel tanks, but they also have the capability to run on LNG. All 13 or 26 locomotives that they have run on LNG. So this, this, this is uh, a project that was prototyped, and it's already now commercially viable, uh, 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 running commercially. Yeah. So uh, and to that point, um, I understand Poland has uh, extensive projects where uh, the minister was talking about how you can get four hours, uh, it's four hours from Warsaw to, to Berlin, but two days to, uh, to Bucharest, uh, or points further south. Um, there are initiatives to move LNG in, in, in smaller volumes. It's called small-scale LNG. So this is a comment. Perhaps this is uh, more appropriate for Ambassador Reka uh, Schmerkenyi's. Uh, but we'll but uh, it's, it's, it's to address that. Well, I think we'll, 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 we'll probably park that and, uh, unless you have a... Uh, just, yeah, just one comment that uh, I made it seriously. So we cannot buy LNG because there's no infrastructure for that because uh, when it comes to the LNG ports in uh, Poland, there's no interconnection between Slovakia and Poland yet. Uh, when it but comes we'll to... Um, when it comes... Yet. When it, when it comes to uh, Croatia, there's no LNG port yet. Uh, so the, uh, the only, only uh, pipeline we can take advantage of is uh, coming from east uh, from, from Russia. So this is reality. I understand it's very hard to understand from this part of the world, but uh, I mean, physics matter. Mm -hmm. And if physically you don't have another infrastructure, what you can do? We hope that there will be an interconnector between Slovakia and uh, Poland. We hope that the Polish will yeah. expand their capacities. We hope that once the uh, Croats build uh, their LNG port. We hope once ExxonMobil will, um, you know, exploit the gas from Romania. But currently, the reality is that none of these projects have been completed yet. Well, thanks very much indeed for rooting us. And I think we, we've come back to where we, we, we started. And it's a good jumping off point for the coffee break and for the discussions that follow. Um, that you cannot, um, if you don't have values, there's no point to it. But if you don't have the facts on the ground, there's no means of getting there, and these things like um, pipelines or logistics when it comes to um, military and the financial flows and so on are the, are the, sinew, the sinews of power, um, which, we, which, we, which we can't get round. And there is, I'm still embarrassed, in a way, to say, as someone who's been dealing with the region for 40 years, that so much hasn't been done since 1989. And it's quite a good thought experiment, which I would leave you with, is just to Put the clock back to 1989 and imagine that you're some kind of decision maker, either in your own profession or something you know, and just think, what should we have done differently? What could we have done in those 30 years so that it would be less unfinished business um, than there is now? Um, but that's for you to, um, to think about. And please enjoy the coffee break, which is a 15-minute break. Be back here at 11 o'clock to talk about China. Nice big subject. And, but before you get up, please join me in thanking all four ministers on the panel. <laughs>